Morning, everybody. Can we take our seats? Thank you very much indeed. As you can see, I've got plenty of seats behind me. That will be for the panel that will come on a little bit later on, in about half an hour or so. Before that, we want to set the scene. I'll start off by welcoming you to the opening of this special session in the 8th World Forest Week, uh, Mainstreaming bi Biodiversity in Forestry. Now, uh, as a radio and television guy, uh, the word biodiversity is one I use occasionally because I am assuming that the audience, the broad audience, can understand. There are some concepts that turn people off, but biodiversity, I think, is one that turns people on because they think bio, okay, that's to do with life and diversity means lots of different things. The flora, the fauna, the trees, the plants, the wildebeest, the lions, the, 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 um, the polar bears, uh, the insects, everything, including we human beings. So that's not difficult. The problem, though, is it's not mainstreamed enough. And we'll be breaking down and examining that concept in this session. So I'm Henry Bonds, I'm a British Ghanaian a journalist and broadcaster. I'm pleased to be your moderator for this session. So biodiversity, we know, plays a really key role in underpinning human well-being. I think people are beginning to understand that more and more. We're not separate from what happens around us. We are part and parcel of it. But what about the way in which we try and conserve the world's biodiversity? How do we interact with it? How do we interact with and use and manage the world's forests, which, as we know, are a haven, if not a cradle, of biodiversity? Well, this is what we're going to examine in this session. I'm going to kick it off with a short video, which will hopefully inspire us this early in the morning as we proceed with this special event. So, Maestro, Marco and team, run VT. That's what we say in TV. Our forests are home to an astonishing 80% of life on land and abound with an amazing variety of creatures, big and small. You know some of them, others might surprise you. Even the tiniest of creatures play a crucial role, working hard to sustain life, enabling trees and all the other remarkable plants to grow. Sometimes, even unnoticed, they are the heroes in the circle of life that keeps our planet healthy. But today, this biodiversity is under serious threat. Millions of hectares of forest are being lost every year. We need to care for our only home by caring for our forests. I think you agree with that. Too precious to lose. And when you see the opening images of those creatures, I wonder how many of those creatures you could name. Don't worry, it's not an examination. But it was beautiful. And to think that in the whole of the universe, as we know thus far, ours is the only planet that we know of thus far, although these new rovers and these new probes that they're sending deeper and deeper into space may find something. But at the moment, we're unique. So why should we have to fight to try and push and mainstream diverse, beautiful human life, biodiversity, animal life, plant life, marine life, forest life. Well, to set the scene, I'm delighted to welcome Thomas Hofer, Senior Forestry Officer, who leads the Forestry Biorestoration Team here at FAO, and he's going to make the opening remarks on behalf of Madame Maria Elena Semido, Deputy Director General of FAO. Thomas, over to you. You can give him a round of applause. He deserves it. Thank you. Thank you. Is that working? Yeah. Thank you, Henry, for setting so nicely the, the stage for this discussion today. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, a very good morning to you. Um, and welcome to this special session of the 8th uh, World, uh, World Forest Week on mainstreaming biodiversity in forests. 
I particularly appreciate all of the delegates who sit here who have been negotiating uh, very late yesterday evening and you still make it this morning to be with us in this very important topic. So welcome especially to you and you agree with me that what we discussed today very well fits to the discussions which were there yesterday in one of the agenda items of the COFO program. I also like to welcome all colleagues, experts who are with us online. As highlighted in the video just now, biodiversity plays a critical role in maintaining human well-being and our economies. Biodiversity underpins the provision of food, fiber and water. It mitigates and provides resilience to climate change. It supports human health and provides jobs in agriculture, fisheries, forestry and many other sectors. Without effective measures to sustainably utilize and conserve biodiversity, the 2030 Agenda will not be achievable. We cannot discuss biodiversity conservation without forests, which are home to most of the world's terrestrial biodiversity. The role of forests in maintaining biodiversity is explicitly recognized by the United Nations Strategic Plan for Forests 2017 to 2030, as well as FAO's strategy on mainstreaming biodiversity across agriculture sectors, which was adopted in 2019. Despite the recognition of the importance of biodiversity to humanity, forests and their biodiversity continue to be lost at an alarming rate. Deforestation is the greatest driver of the loss of valuable plants and animals, with almost 8 million hectares of forests cleared every year, mainly for agriculture expansion. Other threats include overharvesting of timber, invasive species, climate change, desertification, and forest fires. The conservation of the world's biodiversity is utterly dependent on the way we um, in which we interact with and use the world's forests. The critical importance of sustainable forest management in halting deforestation and forest degradation and the associated decline in supply of ecosystem services is well recognized. However, much more needs to be done to make sure that the conservation and sustainable utilization of biodiversity are embedded at every level of forest management. Protecting the animals, plants, fungi and microorganisms that thrive in forests must become a fundamental goal of sustainable forest management worldwide. In 2020, at the 25th session of COFO, member countries requested FAO to conduct a review of biodiversity mainstreaming in forests and share good practices on, and solu on solutions that balance conservation and sustainable use of forest biodiversity. Very important, so that to balance conservation and sustainable use of biodiversity. FAO conduct, conducted this review in partnership with C4 and the CGIAR's research program on forest, trees and agroforestry. We are very happy that the colleagues from, uh, who worked with us are here present with us today. At this special event today, we are pleased to launch the report resulting from this review. The publication summarizes progress worldwide in main mainstreaming biodiversity in forest management and informs future efforts in forestry. It also describes available approaches and tools to ensure the integration of biodiversity concerns in forestry, the forest policy strategy and management. It means it shows solutions, it shows approaches how to move forward. It confirms the urgent need to ensure that biodiversity conservation be mainstreamed into forest management practices in all forest types. To do so, a realistic balance must be struck between conservation goals and local needs and demand for forest resources that support livelihoods, food security and human well-being. This requires many things 
effective government, governance, policy alignment between sectors and administrative levels, land tenure security, respect for the rights and knowledge of local communities and indigenous peoples, and enhanced capacities for monitoring of biodiversity outcomes. It also requires innovative financing modalities. We hope that the wealth of information and recommendations provided in this study will inspire action from those involved in forest management and conservation. In the presentations to follow, we will be learning more about the key findings of this assessment, as well as recommendations that emerged from it. We will also be discussing the way forward, very importantly, in implementing these recommendations on the ground to improve and advance sustainable utilization and conservation of biodiversity in managed forest. Let me conclude by thanking all the experts and stakeholders from partner organizations and countries who have contributed to this assessment and our work on biodiversity mainstreaming. Without such contributions, this work would not have been possible. We look forward to working with all of you to implement the recommendations from the study. The launch of a publication is a start of a process and not the end of a process. I wish you a successful event and fruitful discussions. Thank you so much. Thomas, thank you very much indeed. Wonderful. You've set the scene with a dose of realism. I was just making notes, jotting away furiously as I do when people are speaking so that I can build on what they've said. I mean, the figures you gave us will be familiar to some of you, but 8 million hectares of forest, um, the over-harvesting, the invasive species, the climate change, deforestation, forest fires, the challenges facing people who work in this sector, who want to mainstream biodiversity, and to, I suppose, put a protective arm around the forest, the challenges are huge. But as you said, there is a publication, there are recommendations and assessments being done, and there are possible solutions. So we look forward to hearing what they are. But now, at this point, I'm delighted to invite a gentleman who yesterday described us, we human beings, as being on the Titanic, heading toward the iceberg at full speed, thinking we're okay, maybe moving the deck chairs around while the band plays, and we don't realize we're about to hit the iceberg. Let's hope his metaphors will be less frightening and less vivid this morning. He's the Director General of the Center for International Forestry Research. He has our keynote address. He is Mr. Robert Nassi. Robert, over to you. And you please, despite his scary metaphors, I think we should give him an applause. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Good, good morning, everybody. Uh, good evening, good afternoon for the people online. Uh, <clears throat> I don't see you because I have this light on the right, but it shouldn't be a problem. <clears throat> so what? Managing forests for sustainable use and biodiversity, that's fundamentally what mainstreaming means. I mean, it's sort of when, when I told my, my mom we are going to do something on mainstreaming biodiversity in forestry, she says, what does it mean? I mean, it's sort of what it means taking care of biodiversity and taking care of our forests at the same time. So why? Uh, it's not a new issue, uh, uh, it, but it's gaining a renewed importance uh, given the need to provide a growing population with uh, forest uh, product, everything else being equal, the additional wood material that will be necessary to shift from a fossil fuel-based economy uh, to a bio-based economy. Uh, we are on average uh, consuming uh, 0 0.5 cubic meter of wood Per, <clears throat> per year and per person on the whole world. So if we have, uh, we expect about 900 million people to be uh, with us in 2030, uh, that means that we need to find 450 million cubic meters of wood by then, everything being equal. So if you want to use more wood to build in terms of using concrete, we need uh, to protect our forest and to use our forest. And, and also the imperative to conserve biodiversity and the associated wooden services, uh, pollination, water, carbon. So the question is how should we meet the demand for wood uh, while minimizing uh, climate and biodiversity impact? 
And that is why we mainstream biodiversity. That's to improve the functioning of the forest ecosystem, maximize ecosystem services, to increase the overall productivity, and to increase the resilience of the system. Now, <clears throat> the other answer for my mom was, well, if you want to protect the biodiversity, why do you just have to create protected area? Yes, except that if you look at this data here, yeah? I don't know the point on that. Anyway, <clears throat> you see that a, a massive studies from uh, a WCS, a World Conservation Society, uh, in uh, West, uh, Western Equatorial Africa, which is from the, the Guinea Congolian forest, that shows that there are more in gorilla and chimpanzee than expected, which is a good news, but 80% of these people are outside of protected area. And if you look at the graph on the left, you see that the number of nests are way higher uh, in hunting area, logging concession, and in protected area. So the protected area, although a cornerstone of protecting biodiversity, is not enough. So we need to look at biodiversity in production system, hence forestry. Uh, we all know forest and biodiversity. I mean, forests pr provide habitat for 80% of amphibian species, 75% of birds, uh, 68% of mammal species, I mean, so, so we all know this. <clears throat> but we tend to forget in, in the general uh, uh, dialogue, I mean, the sort of the forest are also creating job, well-being, wealth, <clears throat> it's a big business. Uh, you see the numbers. Uh, well, the wood demand will raise by 450 million uh, cubic meters by uh, 2030. And also that we are starting to build skyscraper in wood. We are starting to use with it. So we need to use forest also for the product they deliver to us. So can we manage for both? And if yes, how? And I will <coughs> go through uh, quickly a series of examples that shows that we can do it. And then the usual question at the end is that why the heck are we not doing it? Uh, so, and to put that in the framework, I mean, a sort of, if you want to manage several things in the same place, you can do it by chance, or you can do it by design, or, or you can do it without really looking at it. I mean, so, and that's how it is. I mean, a sort of, there is a compatibility continuum between production and, and conservation, and it could be inactive. So you, you have forest management tools that maintain biodiversity, which is the do not harm. And, and, and you have management tools that, in fact, have an active view, and it's a thing that's managed both for production and biodiversity values. And, and the series of examples that I will show you are, are always uh, along this continuum. We should go more actively uh, towards the, the right part of it, but even the left part is not too bad. And <clears throat> first example, it's a certified logging concession in, in the Congo Basin. Uh, as protected area, and that's uh, not a very new paper, but by some colleagues uh, that publish in conservation biology. And, and, and they show that, in fact, a certified concession adjacent to a protected area de facto extend the protection value of the overall landscape, allow management of uh, activities uh, uh, in, in the logging concession that are regulated by the protected area. So, so it, it's a win-win situation. Why, why is it not more the case? I don't know. Uh, a few years ago, or so more than a few years ago, we, we wrote this book with some colleagues, uh, Life After Logging in Borneo, I mean, sort of, because there was this, this big belief that if you log over a forest, then everything is gone. And that may be true if you do a clear cutting, but if you are in the tropics where you cut a, a few or, or less than a few tim timber species per hectare, there is still a lot of forest left and there's still a lot of biodiversity. There is a huge value of these log over forests and, and they should be given more attention than they are now if we really want uh, to mainstream biodiversity. And you have this paper in Nature that the title says all. I mean, a log forest in Borneo is better than no forest at all. Then the, another interesting uh, case is the timber and, uh, and Brazil nut. I mean, Brazil nut are very important commodity uh, in this case, it's in Peru. Uh, and uh, if it's a big tree, eh? the Brazilian tree, the Bertoletia, is a, it's a huge tree, it's a timber tree also. <coughs> and the, the law says that you have a concession for Brazil nut and a concession for logging. And you cannot do logging in the Brazil nut concession. You cannot harvest Brazil nut in the logging concession. 
But then, looking at data, we saw that there were more timber coming out of the Brazil nut concession than the logging concession. Uh, and, and of course, logging is linked with canopy damage. You can damage the canopy, you get less nuts. But science shows also that if you have an intensity of 1.2 or commercial timber tree per hectare, the fruit production of Brazil nut is unaltered. So if you look at the two things, you say, okay, maybe we should reduce the logging intensity in the logging concession to be uh, adequate for Brazil nut concession, and we should allow logging uh, in the Brazil nut concessions to the extent that it doesn't impair the Brazil nut. Again, managing for timber and biodiversity. Plantation is it, it, a big story and it's going to be an even bigger story. I mean, a sort of plantation could be something like on the left, clonal, monoclonal eucalypts plantation, or on the right. Uh, multi-diverse agroforestry system. And both are good. I mean, a sort of uh, plantation represents about 7% of the total for, uh, forested or wooded area, and, 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 but they produce something like 30% of the timber and fiber. So if we want to have more timber and fiber, maybe we should allocate some place for intensively managed plantation. But it shouldn't be the sort of the initial reflect reaction of the well, I want to offset my carbon uh, uh, emissions, so I'm going to plant uh, 10, 20 billion trees. I mean, it's sort of, this has to be thought through, and plantation should also be designed to mainstream biodiversity and production. Another interesting uh, example is the community uh, forestry concession in Petten, and, and, <coughs> and this, you have the quote from this. These are concessions that, that were given to, to communities uh, 25 years, more than 25 years ago and that were renewed. And that show that you can harvest non timber forest product, you can be FSC certified, you can uh, make some money uh, by selling uh, your organic timber, you can send your, your kids to school, you can build facilities, and, and, and it works, and its forests are still there. And these forests are in a better shape than the protected area nearby. And that brings us to the importance of uh, indigenous land for uh, maintenance or for biodiversity. And uh, <coughs> you see this, this quote on the paper that was published in 2019, uh, indigenous managed land have equal or higher biodiversity than protected areas. Again, I mean, it's sort of where people have been the steward of the land for a long time and under uh, reasonable condition and where they given the right to exercise uh, their, their, their use, and generally speaking, they naturally maintain biodiversity uh, at the same time as using for production. And uh, an, an example that is, this one is just a, a glimpse of what will be presented later, the, the, the report that Thomas was talking about, uh, is this uh, cork. Uh, uh, cork is very important, especially for French and Italian, is that why you book the bottle of wine? So, uh, and uh, yeah, the plastic that don't work as well as the core one. And, and how do you combine biodiversity, uh, job economic return, and, and bioeconomy? And, 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 and this is a very good example where you have a lot of people depending on this cork industry in the Mediterranean area. You have also uh, some emblematic uh, protected endangered species that depend on this area. And, and you have also a large prospect for uh, uh, very high tech development like the insulation of deep, deep spikes rocket from fire and ice. So this is a, a good example of where you can also mainstream uh, biodiversity. So what, what were the basic tenets uh, of, of all this? I mean, it requires a proper enabling environment and legal framework. I mean, a sort of, if the law tells you that you should not cut or you shouldn't do anything, then it's not helping. If the law doesn't tell you anything, then it's not helping either. So laws should be designed with an encompassing view of we want to both conserve sustainable use and equitably share the, uh, the benefits of biodiversity, which is the motto of the CBD, and which should be the case as most of the country are, are, are signatory parties to the CBD. There should be optimization at various scale and, and not try to to have maximization. So you don't try to have the maximum amount of wood. You try to have the optimal amount of wood <coughs> that allow you at the same time to keep the optimal amount of biodiversity and to improve the livelihood of the people on the optimal amount. <coughs> and of course, because we are living in an economic world, it should be based on the net present value of the most uh, valuable product. 
So if your most valuable product is great apes, this is your center point. If your most valuable product is cork, cork is your center point. <coughs> and of course, you have to consider the variable uh, possible interaction. I mean, there is no free lunch, so it's all about trade-offs. So things could be independent. Whatever you do in biodiversity is independent to whatever you do in production. Could be competitive or could be complementary. <coughs> and <coughs> if you have this all in place, uh, then it's not impossible and then we should do it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Robert. And um, I love the fact that uh, you discussed your presentation with your mom and she gave you guidance, as mothers tend to do, uh, in helping you frame uh, your remarks for us today. And you took us through a variety of scenarios there, but you explained what we need to do. The framework and the enabling environment is key. And I like the fact that you talk about trade-offs and it's not even in this mercantile and growth obsessed world that we have. Everyone's going growth, 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 GDP, GDP, GDP. But it's optimal, not maximum, not maximum. So thank you very much indeed. So we heard earlier, and you hinted at it as well, so we heard from Thomas Hofer earlier that we're going to get the key findings from the assessment on biodiversity mainstreaming in forestry. And we have the uh, forestry officer from the forest management team at FAO, who is here to present those findings. He's Kenichi Shono, who will discuss and take us through this assessment on biodiversity, mainstreaming in forestry, conducted by FAO and C4. So this is gonna be some really good, crunchy, numbered assessment, which we can then build on in the panel discussion, which will take place afterwards. So, uh, Kenichi, it's over to you now. Where are you? Are you here? Fantastic. He's now put his jacket on, so he's ready to rumble. Very good. Okay. Look forward to hearing what you have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Henry, for the introduction. Um, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, once again, very good morning to you all. I'm very happy to be here this morning uh, to be able to share with you the key findings uh, from our assessment on biodiversity mainstreaming, uh, which was conducted in partnership between FAO uh, C4 and ECRAF. We'll, we'll also be launching the publication at the end of my uh, presentation. So I wanted to, uh, next please. I wanted to uh, start my presentation by providing some background uh, that provides context to the need for this assessment. Can we move the slides? Okay, yes, uh, but yeah, I think these points have been covered by the uh, previous speakers already, so I will move on to the next slide. Uh, next, please. Okay, no one before. <laughs> okay, yes. Okay, so uh, looking at the uh, distribution of global forests by management objectives, 18% of all forests is legally protected and managed for conservation. However, a much larger 30% is managed for production of timber and non-wood forest products. Furthermore, much of the remaining 52% is in fact used for various productive purposes, uh, even though it may be under multiple use management or they may actually not have any designated objective, uh, but they are in fact being used by people for production. As shown by many research results, well-managed production forests can support significant biodiversity values and provide uh, valuable ecosystem services while generating income, which is very important. What this tells us is that sustainable management of forests that are managed for production rather than for conservation as the, as the primary purpose has a critical role in biodiversity conservation. Okay. The process for this uh, assessment started in uh, 2020 at COFO 25, where the member countries uh, made a specific recommendation, a request for FAO to conduct uh, this assessment. So shortly after COFO, uh, together with C4, we uh, initiated a two-year process to address this recommendation, which included extensive uh, literature review, expert interviews, consultations, commissioning of country case studies, peer reviews, and so on. And we shared the preliminary findings at the World Forestry Congress in May uh, this year, 
and we are now ready to officially uh, launch the findings and the publication. So this study aimed to address four objectives. First, to assess the state of biodiversity mainstreaming in the forest sector. Second, take stock of existing concepts and tools for integrating biodiversity in forest management. Third, review the range of policy instruments that, beyond legal protection, can enhance biodiversity conservation. And fourth, recommend actions to advance biodiversity mainstreaming in the forest sector. So I just wanted to uh, quickly share the, uh, the definition of biodiversity mainstreaming that we adopted for this study so that uh, hopefully Robert's uh, mom can also understand this. Um, so what this means in the forest sector is uh, mainstreaming forest, uh, biodiversity in forest management in forestry involves prioritizing forest policies, plans, programs, projects, investments, and field practices that have a positive impact on biodiversity at the ecosystem, species, and genetic levels. So with this definition in mind, uh, let us go into the key findings from assessment. In this study, we first looked at the uh, policy aspect and found that there is a strong basis for sustainable use and conservation of biodiversity um, in various uh, forest policies and strategies, and these include the uh, national biodiversity strategies and action plans in the countries, NDCs, as well as the various global and national commitments to restoration. Uh, we then examined the available approaches and instruments in biodiversity mainstreaming in the forest sector and found also that a wide variety of approaches and instruments are being used in various different combinations under different contexts in different uh, regions and countries. With regards to approaches, uh, there are mainly two approaches. The first approach focuses on spatial planning which uh, basically aims to design land use patterns that optimize the flow of desired set of ecosystem services at the landscape level. And uh, in, in discussing this issue, the spatial approach, we also examine the uh, land sparing versus uh, sharing approaches and discuss which approach might work better in certain contexts. So that's also um, described in the report. The second approach focuses on species uh, typically targeting those species that are threatened by human activities, migratory species, species causing human wildlife conflict, invasive species, overabundant native species, and species of economic value that are being harvested. Moving on to the uh, instruments. First, we have uh, the regulatory instruments in the form of quotas, permits, and licenses that regulate how forests are managed and how forests are harvested. In almost all countries, there are also legal provisions for environmental protection and species conservation that place restrictions on activities that have negative environmental or ecological impacts. Economic instruments, which often works together with regulatory instruments, are also an important tool in biodiversity mainstreaming. These include taxes, subsidies, grants, that provide economic incentives for people to manage forests sustainably and responsibly. When we talk about economic instruments, uh, we must also recognize the presence of perverse incentives which counters our efforts to promote sustainable use and conservation of biodiversity. For example, subsidies for agricultural inputs or forest conversion uh, can encourage further expansion of agricultural lands at the expense of forests. In addition, market-based instruments uh, are also playing an increasingly important role in fostering positive change in forest management. Various payment for ecosystem services schemes, most commonly for climate change mitigation, uh, as well as water regulation, can provide economic incentives for forest management practices that result in uh, net positive uh, biodiversity outcomes. Forest certification is another important market instrument which can provide uh, and ensure access to forest products uh, coming from forests that are uh, being managed legally and responsibly. Oops, okay. Participatory forest management, so various forms of community-based, uh, people-based forest management has been in practice for decades, and uh, this form of forest management offers opportunities to provide biodiversity benefits by putting people at the center of decision-making and implementation of forest management 
as mentioned in uh, uh, Robert's uh, speech regarding indigenous managed lands and their effectiveness in conservation of uh, biodiversity. Finally, support to knowledge and capacity development is also a critical aspect, uh, generation of data and information and facilitating their use in informed decision making as well as uh, capacity building in sustainable forest management at all levels. Uh, these are all keys to biodiversity mainstreaming efforts in forestry. However, despite the availability of all these various tools and approaches, forest and the biodiversity continue to be lost. And uh, this study identified five major uh, barriers and threats that contribute to the situation. I'm sure you are all aware of these um, issues. First, there's the continuing deforestation. Second, illegal forest activities underlain by uh, poor forest governance. Low profile conservation outside protected areas which means that biodiversity is not given adequate consideration in the management of forests uh, that are outside the protected areas. And lastly, um, no insufficient capacity to plan and implement as well as to monitor sustainable forest management. Uh, this also hampers efforts to improve biodiversity and forest management. And lastly, uh, lack of meaningful engagement of indigenous uh, peoples and local communities which results in uh, unsustainable impacts of interventions. Uh, diving closer to the ground, uh, we then assessed and identified concrete forest management measures that can enhance uh, biodiversity outcomes at the level of forest management unit. So what can forest management managers do to improve biodiversity outcomes in managed forests? First, there's the need to assess and manage risks of forest operations to biodiversity. Uh, before operations take place. And the uh, high conservation value or HCV assessment uh, can often provide a useful framework for this by assessing and managing risks, uh, especially in the context of tropical forest management. Establishing and managing set aside areas of natural forest, ideally representing all forest ecosystem types present in the forest management unit is another effective way of conserving biodiversity in managed forest. And this is also part of a, a regulatory requirement in many countries. Protecting critical biodiversity resources such as sea trees or trees, dead wood, nesting sites, feeding sites, etc., uh, is also another important measure. And, the la and lastly, sustainable management of timber resources uh, is also a critical issue, especially in the tropics where uh, there's a limited number of commercial timber species that are selectively harvested from natural forest. And uh, these commercial species are often uh, sparsely distributed and selectively removing uh, individuals of good form and good quality. Uh, this is often uh, unsustainable because there's not enough regeneration to replace trees that have been lost or harvested. Uh, Non-wood forest products, including plants and wildlife, uh, these often play uh, uh, an important role in regional and local economies as well as for uh, subsistence but their harvest is mostly unregulated and unmonitored. However, this practice can have significant impact on biodiversity and such practice needs to be regulated to ensure sustainability. We also need to pay attention to uh, sustainable management of forest genetic resources, especially given the ecological impacts of the changing climate. Invasive species, uh, which has been mentioned before, uh, this is another key driver of biodiversity loss. So forest managers do need to pay attention uh, to the management and control of invasive species as well. Finally, forest under management needs to be protected from illegal and unauthorized activities, including poaching of timber, wildlife, uh, as well as encroachment. So based on these uh, assessment findings, we came up with a, a recommendations, 11 recommendations that we uh, consider to be the most urgent and impactful priorities to consider in facilitating biodiversity mainstreaming in the forest sector. These include uh, halting and reversing deforestation, combating illegal and unregulated forest activities, recognizing the forest tenure of indigenous peoples and local communities, preventing conversion of natural forests into monospecific plantations, ensuring sustainable management of harvested species, including timber species and non-wood forest uh, product species. Managing invasive and over-abundant over native species, 
uh, leveraging the global momentum that we have on ecosystem restoration to enhance biodiversity, adopting a multi-sectoral perspective and working across sectors, providing economic incentives for biodiversity positive uh, actions on the ground, facilitating market-based instruments, and supporting knowledge and capacity development. So as Thomas mentioned during the panel discussion, we will be discussing how we can move forward in implementing some of these recommendations on the ground. So we look forward to hearing your thoughts and ideas on that. So with this, I'm very happy to announce the launching of our publication, which is hopefully uh, alive. I'm not sure, I haven't checked, so hopefully it is online. And uh, so on behalf of uh, FAO, C4, and all the co-authors, I'd like to thank our partner organizations, case study authors, experts consulted during the process, as well as all the people involved in reviewing, editing, designing, and laying out the publication. So thanks very much to uh, everyone who has been involved. Uh, this has been a very much uh, collective, uh, collective effort, and uh, so thanks once again. Kenichi, thank you very much indeed. Very comprehensive. Two years of hard work as mandated by the 25th COFO, and now we see the results. I'm going to try and use um, the recommendations, the toolkit that you've provided for us in the next part of this session. Um, and please, I believe that is, your, your document is now live. It's, it's not moribund, it's breathing and living, and we can, we can use it, which is fantastic. Some excellent, rich content now, officially published, and it will enable us to uh, carry things forward in a very systemic way with the background that you've given us. So now, um, let's proceed with our panel discussion, which is going to focus on, uh, on the way forward and try and see how we can implement some of these recommendations that Kenichi Shono has just presented to us. Let me invite the panelists to come to the podium or to the platform. So they are Ms. Jamal Anaklichova from the Convention of Biological Diversity Secretariat, which is based, I believe, in Canada. Is that right? Please welcome up on stage. I think you've already been told, all of you, where you're going to be sitting. I know I'm going to be sitting here. Uh, also, uh, Mr. Vincent Gitz from C4. Um, please come up on stage. Mr. Tony is a vendor of Entre from the International Model Forest Network Secretariat, also in Canada. Mr. Kaba Urgesa Dinsa from the government of Ethiopia, the federal government of Ethiopia. And Mr. Tetsuo Tanimoto from the government of Japan, who I think I met the other day. Uh, at the plenary. So thank you very much. And for those participants joining us online, we invite you to post any comments or questions that you have in the chat. Now we'll try, if we can, to address some of those as they occur. And perhaps if we get the time, take one or two comments or contributions from the floor. But please don't worry if we don't get to them, we will uh, save them and consider them in the future planning of our work. So thank you very much indeed, panelists. Where are we going to start? Okay, well, let's start off with the Convention of Biological Diversity. And Ms. Uh, Anna Klitschkova can update us on the discussions leading to CBD COP15 and how the post-2020 biodiversity framework is shaping up. So, over to you. Thank you. Hopefully it's working. Yes. Good morning. Yes. yes, it works. So good morning, everyone. So the participants who woke up so early and also the participants online. Um, it's a great pleasure and honor to me, it, for me to be part of this panel discussion. And I'm also very excited to be part of this discussion because of the topic we're discussing today, how to mainstream biodiversity into forest sector. And why it is important for us for the Convention on Biological Diversity, because it opens up the discussion of mainstreaming biodiversity in a broader agricultural sector, not only in the forest sector. And because we're just three months before the adoption of the post-2020 global biodiversity framework. So, and I would take it for granted that everyone in this room knows what the global, the future global biodiversity framework is. And um, well, this is a, a successor framework from the um, biodiversity plan and its 20 IG targets, which were completed in 2020. 
So, and it took almost, it, it's, it's still ongoing process of negotiations and um, it's been three years now of intensive um, negotiation process so we're uh, three months before the finish line of adoption. But really just to see what is the, uh, what is shaping now the current uh, draft uh, of the future global biodiversity framework. I think what is important is to take a quick glimpse of what we have learned from the previous biodiversity framework. So it was also a 10 years framework and what we have achieved. And I would like to mention only two um, main observation and what we have learned, what the world has learned from the implementation of this framework. So the two, two observations, two lessons learned. The first of all, that we should not really treat all the goals um, you know, in isolated way, in the linear way. So all the goals and everything should be interconnected. So, and it's, which should count as a, all pieces of one puzzle. So it sounds beautiful, but that adds the complexity to the negotiations. And the second, which is more of a technical nature, is that the countries need to agree on the protocol for the monitoring. So the monitoring means that we need to agree what should be the indicators, what should be the baselines the country will be measuring their progress. Because one of the reasons why so many Aichi targets were either partially achieved or not achieved, it's just simply one of the reasons, simply because we could not collect in a systematic way the stories uh, from the countries. So in all the good cases, what was already happening in the country. So we could not really collect it, we could not analyze it and bring it to the regional and the global level. So with these two lessons learned in, line, in mind, so the countries embarked on the negotiation process for the uh, future global biodiversity framework. So the countries have established the open-ended working group. It already met four times. Uh, the countries are already working on the second or even the third iteration of the draft. And um, I would like to thank FAO and also the members of Collaborative Partnership and Forest for providing uh, technical input and assistance to the countries during the ongoing negotiations. So that was um, very appreciated. So what is now in the, in the current draft? What do we see in the current draft of the global biodiversity framework? So where is the forest in this current draft? So even if the forest is not maybe that explicitly mentioned so far as it was in the Aichi targets, um, but still we can say that the forest is everywhere because the it's really the formulation of the target goes by ecosystem. So it mentioned the ecosystem, including the forest. Mm -hmm. And since I mentioned this one uh, principle, which the countries are applying now for the discussion of the future uh, biodiversity uh, targets, the interconnectedness of all the targets. So I, it would, I wouldn't make a justice if I only would single out few targets uh, which are currently under the negotiations. But I would like to mention, of course, that we cannot protect the forest and, as, and to um, have the sustainable forest management without the biodiversity inclusive spatial planning. So that's the target one, the draft target one of the um, biodiversity framework. So we cannot achieve um, um, cannot protect forest without restoration. Um, that's the draft target too. Um, protected areas, how do we manage well and how do we ensure the connectivity among the protected areas? So we just were hearing in the previous uh, presentation, this is a striking uh, numbers that sometimes you have more species abundance outside of the protected areas. So the reason why is because sometimes they're not so well connected. So we're talking about invasive species, how to manage invasive species. So the countries are, they want to mitigate the impact of the climate change on biodiversity, which the forest is uh, also, um, is one of the ecosystem which is really suffering a lot. 
So, and talking about the forestry as a part of the agricultural system under the sustainable management. So, if we really go across all currently 22 targets which are now under negotiations um, in the global biodiversity framework. So, but there are also targets which would work as a leverage. So, they're means of implementation and they're, they're also very important for uh, protecting forest and sustainable forest management. So, I'm talking about the um, um, reforming or redirecting harmful incentives. I'm talking about the capacity building. I'm talking about the knowledge management, including traditional and indigenous knowledge, resource mobilization. So it's really, if you just pull away one target, so this whole puzzle would not come together. So, and that's the complexity, which adds so much complexity to the negotiations. Mm -hmm. And really now, a very quick on the timeline, just as I said, it's where three months before the adoption. Um, so the fourth meeting in Nairobi concluded with a recommendation to establish the technical group. The technical group met last week and they really managed to streamline the text of the draft of global biodiversity framework. So, and this will come as a recommendation to the fifth and the final meeting of the um, open-ended working group. So, and no more details, but what I would like to say in my final remarks that um, the success of the implementation of the future global uh, biodiversity framework is not only on how well we formulated as much as we wanted um, the global target, but when it really comes to the implementation at the country level, that's where the success lies. So how to bring this publication, a nice publication, coming from the knowledge to the planning and then to the practice. So I'm really looking forward to this discussion today. Very Thank good. You. Thank you very much, Jamal. And the over. Thank you very much indeed. So you're, I mean, I'm an athletics fan, so when you mention finish line, I can see vividly what you mean. But sometimes when you're in a marathon, you hit the wall at mile 22. And so between mile 22 and mile 26, you go through pain, you go through hell. I think that's what you're going through at the moment in trying to um, get agreement on these 22 targets for the framework. But hopefully it will be achieved in the next three months. So thank you very much indeed. And now I'm going to invite Mr. Ventre, to, uh, who is representing the International Model Forest Network, to share with us their experience in integrating biodiversity conservation in forest management among their model forest sites. I like the idea of model forest sites across the world. So over to Mr. Ventre. Thank you, Mr. Borson. Oops. Yeah, can we swap microphones? That one seems to be... Hello? Oh, yes, 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 yes. Thank you, Mr. Borson. Good morning, everyone. And uh, for here in the hall and those from all places and times around the world. Dear colleagues, it's a great honor for me to be in this very important and prestigious forum to represent the International Model Forest Network and to do so in a session that deals with one of the issues that is closer to the heart of the, our network. Let me briefly introduce ourselves. The International Model Forest Network was born in 1992 thanks to the Government of Canada which immediately understood the importance of putting together three fundamental principles to get the objective set by the Rio conference that very same year off the ground, landscapes, partnership and sustainability. Bringing them together in the territories and thanks to the local communities, the network grows today involving over 60 modern forests in more than 30 countries and over 70 million hectares. Going to the topic of this session, I want to focus on the tools that we can adopt so that the action identified by international and the national strategies can become active awareness for the population that, that have to implement them on each individual territory. How can, move, how can we move beyond words and plans into action? The treats to biodiversity are, are undoubtedly complex in their dimensions, but even more so are the actions to reduce their impact, especially in relation to the need to implement them in a balanced and harmonious manner 
with respect to the needs of human communities. We know that never before in the history of mankind have we had at our disposal so many tools of knowledge provided by science and technology from the great work of countless research institutes and scientists around the world. But we are at the same time aware that this knowledge must be supplemented with the often ancestral knowledge given by local communities and even more so by indigenous people who are, who are able in many cases to maintain the biodiversity of their territories thanks to humans' equal approach to our surroundings. For some years now, the urban population has outnumbered the rural population. This is an often underestimated obstacle with, when, even with respect to the ability to implement biodiversity-friendly strategies, simply because uh, it increases the distance between uh, human communities and the natural environment and decreases the time needed for both to understand and implement. What can we do and what can we learn from the IMFN? 30 years of experiences in over 60 modern forests are too many to say now. I would like to share with you only some examples that balance conservation and sustainable use of forest biodiversity. And these seeds of change happen at both very large and very small scales, as does all type of change in a landscape. For example, India, Kodagu Modern Forest, revived more than 1,200 hectares uh, sacred grove sites that were losing their physical, social, cultural and religious significance. Re uh, Dominican Republic, Colinas Bajas Modern Forest, brought, brought together local stakeholders, the government and the mining company to extend the successful forest landscape restoration initiative and established as biological corridor between two protected areas. Canada, Eastern Ontario Model Forest have also an instrumental in identifying forest areas of high conservation value within a timber production landscape. In our Mediterranean region, for in Croatia, Model Forest of Istria, truffles are among the region's most valuable non-timber forest product and providing a living income from approximately 1,000 families. Bolivia, Sikitano Model Forest, with an area of approximately 20 million hectares, is a unique dry tropical forest with an extraordinary rich natural diversity. And through the Model Forest, the district in initiated a participatory process to promote the creation of a protected area on a municipal land. The Convention on Biological Diversity recommends ecosystem approach to guide the forts in conserving biodiversity. Both born in 1992, model forest stakeholders commit to developing, testing, and sharing tools and approaches to managing landscapes in a sustainable manner through an ecosystem. Actions beyond the words. With thanks to our hosts, collaboration between the IMFN and FAO began in 1999, when FAO has Asia Pacific Regional Office led on establishment of the first modern forest in that region with the assistance of the government of Japan. 23 years ago, IMFN and FAO were together forging a path. FAO Forestry and the IMFN Secretariat recently formally extended their collaboration to 2024. New areas of work are emerging together on the UN decade on ecosystem restoration, including forest-based ecosystem disaster risk reduction. Thanks once again to the general support of the government of Japan and the International Union of, uh, for the Conservation of Nature. In conclusion, as IMFN, we could be pleased to celebrate our 30th anniversary by looking at the great work done in these three decades in many parts of the world. But in reality, we have a way we are aware that the seriousness of the situation we find ourselves in requires all of us to increase our efforts tenfold and learn from the past so that in the future we can have the possibility of a planet still inhabited of our species.
Thank you Thanks. very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Ventre. Is it Ventre or Ventre? Ventre. Ah, Ventre, Ventre. I said Ventre. Because Ventre is a French for stomach, isn't it? Ventre. Yeah, Mr. Stomach. No, no. <laughs> Mr. Ventre. Thank you very much. It's great to hear about the history and the individual success stories in India and Dominican Republic and uh, Canada, Bolivia, etc. But that's really encouraging. Happy 30th birthday as well. Now, Mr. Tanimoto from the government of Japan, and people think when they think of Japan, they tend to think of the big urban centers, don't they? You know, uh, like Tokyo, and uh, Yokohama, etc. But of course, Japan does have forests, and it has, a, as I heard from you the other day in the plenary, a very detailed plan for the management and conservation of forests. And now we're going to hear about your experience in biodiversity mainstreaming the government of Japan's approaches, successes, challenges, and we want to hear about future opportunities as well. So, Mr. Tanimoto, please, over to you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you for introducing me, Mr. Bones, and uh, uh, good morning, uh, everyone. And so, good afternoon, good evening, so online participants. Uh, I'm Tanimoto from the so International Forestry Cooperation Office, uh, Forestry Agency Japan. Uh, and thank you so for giving me uh, this excellent opportunity to uh, share and so briefly introduce uh, effort to mainstreaming uh, biodiversity conservation in forest management in Japan. Uh, my intervention uh, will touch on three points. Uh, first, I will on an overview uh, to of conservation of biodiversity in forest management in national forest and challenges uh, of biodiversity conservation. And second, uh, I will introduce um, the Akaya Forest Initiative uh, as an example of biodiversity conservation uh, in cooperation with local residents. Uh, finally, in my concluding remarks, I will talk about the way forward. Uh, let me begin let me begin uh, my mentioning that 67% uh, of the total land area of Japan is forest. Yeah. Uh, with a diverse number of ec ecosystems uh, ranging, ranging from subtropical to uh, temperate. In a very carbon negative way. So, boreal forest. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, while managing forests, uh, it is important to maintain and demonstrate the multiple functions of forests, such as landslide prevention and water conservation. Uh, particularly in national forests, uh, where large areas of forests deep in the mountains are crucial for biodiversity conservation. Uh, we have designated uh, uh, <laughs> We have designated uh, about 1 million hectares of primal forest uh, as protected forest. Protected forests are managed to maintain the national environment, uh, protect wildlife and genetic resources, uh, conduct academic researches, uh, and so on. In this way, uh, we are mainstreaming biodiversity into forest management practices. However, there are challenges. Uh, for one thing, uh, there are improperly managed planted forests. If thinning of planted forest is not conducted, uh, the light level, the forest floor, is become low. Uh, so uh, there will be no undergrowth uh, and the demonstration of expected multiple function of forests, including biodiversity conservation, will be in danger. Uh, now, I'd like to introduce an example of, of biodiversity conservation through sustainable forest management in cooperation with local residents. Uh, there are 10,000 hectares of the na national forest called Akaya Forest, uh, near the center of Japanese archipelago. Uh, three parties the Council of Local Residents, the Nature Conservation Association, and the Forestry Agency uh, play a central role in uh, central role in effort to restore biodiversity and create su sustainable local communities. Uh, what is remarkable 
is that our management system has golden eagles uh, as the conservation target species. Uh, they, are at the, they are at the top of ecosystem and indicator of forest, biodi forest biodiversity richness. Uh, specifically, we deliberately uh, set up the clear-cut area, uh, then uh, select about four hectares uh, in order to create a hunting ground for golden eagles. Uh, as a result, uh, we observe hunting behavior around the clear-cut area and increasing breeding. Um, clear cutting and loss of forest cover are generally seen as a negative impact on biodiversity. But in this case, uh, by improving the habitat of the golden eagle, it leads to conserv conserving and enriching wildlife diversity. The case of Akaya is a good example of our effort uh, that emphasizes the conservation of biodiversity in national forests. Uh, but it is also unique in that it is an initiative in cooperation with local residents and nature conservation organizations. Uh, going forward, uh, we will continue to promote uh, initiatives similar to the one of Akaya uh, that will expand the method of biodiversity conservation in cooperation with local stakeholders. Thank you for your attention. Tanimoto, thank you very much indeed for that very uh, comprehensive assessment of Japan's experience. And uh, did you mention the golden eagle, I think? And uh, an iconic uh, bird, a predatory bird, a raptor, feared quite rightly, but of course to be treasured. And it's wonderful that that um, beautiful bird of prey is being respected. And protected and hopefully will flourish in Japan and uh, iconic and what you do with that uh, bird you can do with other species as well so fantastic now let's move from Japan to East Africa to the Horn of Africa and indeed to Ethiopia um, and I'm going to call on Mr. Urgesa from the government of Ethiopia to share with us his country's experience in biodiversity mainstreaming as well as perspectives going forward sir over to you Thank you very much, uh, moderator. Uh, thank you also for the organizers for having me here today to speak on this uh, important topic of mainstreaming biodiversity into forest management. I think my assignment is actually to tell you about what is uh, approaches, successes, challenge, lessons learned, and way forward when uh, we have to talk about mainstreaming biodiversity into the Ethiopian uh, forest management. Just to start with, uh, Ethiopia with a total uh, land area of 1.13 million square kilometers that spans over a wide range of altitudes from 110 meters below sea level to over 4,600 meters above sea level. The wide altitudinal coverage caused the diverse climate, topography, and soil. Ethiopia has diverse ecosystem located in different highlands, mid-altitudes, lowlands, and diverse biological diversities. However, it is biodiversity and ecosystem resources are highly threatened by different factors, which is very common, I think, to all of us, and that is common to Ethiopia as well. This call for biodiversity mainstreaming into development objectives or planning. The approach used to mainstream the biodiversity to forest management of Ethiopia includes policy and legal framework that enhance forest sector conservation and management, national biodiversity strategy and action, action plan that enhance it actually in situ and ex situ conservation of forest biodiversity, sustainable land management approach, climate resilient green economy initiatives, growth and transformation plans, participatory forest management, red plus strategy, incentives, and the Ethiopian forest sector development programs, of course, and lately, the green legacy, which I think yesterday or day before yesterday I've, I've presented in the plenary. Implementing these approaches, Ethiopia have succeeded in having better achievement from uh, PFM piloting, 
obtained higher returns from Rain Forest Alliance certification of semi-forest coffee by granting farmers a better price. <coughs> Biodiversity conservation was also very effective through the community seed bank. National Biodiversity and Action Plan was made part of the National Plan by Planning Commission. Uh, I think this, this is actually very important. Everybody, when any sector ministry is planning, they have to consider biodiversity to be mainstream in their planning. This is uh, it's a directive from the National Planning Commission. Otherwise, you may, your, your plan may not be get approved. So there is also better support from the policymakers by making repeated awareness creation are among the few to be uh, mentioned. The member of parliament are really very, very active in actually mainstreaming these plants into um, uh, this uh, biodiversity into everybody's plan. While implementing all these approaches and achieving all these successes, there are also challenges. I mentioned actually the major ones. These are low commitment from stakeholders to scale up participatory forest management, low progress in institutionalizing it as well, conflicting interest among, <coughs> among sectors, policy and decision makers focus on short-term results, limited financial resources, lack of clear ownership, especially on the community-owned forest, absence of clear benefit sharing mechanisms, lack of affordable technologies, unpredicted extreme climate events, and the lack of well-organized data are some of these to be mentioned as a major challenges, in addition to what has been mentioned in previous presentations. Through all this process, there are lessons learned. To mention some of them, the practices learned from different projects have laid foundation for possible scale-up. Importance of monitoring the success regularly, especially in community ownership. Importance of coordinated action in achieving higher impacts. Overlapping institutional mandates which led to unsatisfactory results are the learning points actually. And the need for effective monitoring and evaluation mechanism for tracing impact. To conclude the present, the, my presentation, the moderator, as a way forward, Ethiopia needs to enhance effective commitment and law enforcement toward this mainstreaming biodiversity into forest management. Apply effective land use policy, maintain balance between internal and external fund mobilization, need coordinated action to achieve higher impact, development of sustainable commercial forestry and to have legally binding instruments. Monitoring and evaluation mechanisms as well. Still, more awareness creation to policymakers who sometimes focus more on short-term gains and local community on the actual benefits of the forestry and its contribution to biodiversity. And finally, we need to continue with our green legacy so that we can expand forest, we can enrich our forest, we can maintain our diversity. Thank you very much. Mr. Okisa, thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much for that uh, presentation, giving us the perspective of the government of uh, Ethiopia. I'm encouraged by the fact that uh, ministers know that their plans may not be approved unless they consider the, uh, I suppose, the impact on biodiversity, that's a very powerful signal. And I take what you said about all the other challenges uh, which uh, Mr. Uh, Kenichi also mentioned in his presentation at the country level, that's important to hear. Now, finally, I invite Mr. Vincent Gitz from C4 to reflect on these interventions. You may want to reflect live on what you've just heard and also your thoughts on how we move forward in implementing some of the recommendations we've heard over the past hour because we want to advance sustainable uh, conservation of biodiversity in managed forests. So over to you, Mr. Vincent Gitz. Th thank you, Henry. And, and I think today, uh, both from the presentation and the panelists, we have uh, a lot of food for thought. 
from from that and also from the study, of course, we, we, we did with FAO, I, I note the centrality of governance. Uh, of the involvement of all concerned stakeholders. And I think uh, we heard from uh, uh, Tony Venture, in fact, the International Model Forest Network is, is it's model governance, more, even more than, than model forest. And, and, and that um, makes the, the need for uh, these decisions or, or these um, uh, governance level actions to be grounded on a lot of knowledge, knowledge sharing and and knowledge transmission and to a certain extent the 18 percent of of protected areas um, to protect biodiversity uh, area protection and reserves are, are some form of a simple measure uh, you define the area you protect the area this conserve the forest the way it is and for effectiveness you don't necessarily need to know a lot of things of what's going on in the forest ecosystem functioning and so on so it's kind of a left on, on Robert's diagram, the measure on, on the left more, more passive and implementation of control is challenging, but at least in theory, it's simple. Uh, now mainstreaming biodiversity in, uh, through in forest management and through forest management require much more knowledge on, okay, what is the baseline for, for management? What is the baseline of biodiversity? What needs to be taken care of, such as uh, uh, habitats and conservation targets in the Akaya forest, for instance, as, as uh, Mr. Tanimoto has, has explained? What impact each intervention has on the forest and biodiversity? What are the good practices to reduce these impacts and how to measure impact? And, and yes, um, Jamal mentioned the challenges to develop a monitoring framework for the CBD, but it's also much more difficult to control and monitor management and practices as compared, for instance, to just protected areas. So practices cannot be really fully controlled, and this is especially true when you consider the, the breadth, the diversity of actors that are part, knowingly or not, of what we call forest management. Of course, there are foresters, hunters, but the gatherers, indigenous peoples, uh, population, and increasingly outsiders. I think we've seen, uh, and as part of the FTA program, we've, we've made some studies on the impact of, of uh, the lockdowns due to COVID on, on wildlife. And this has revealed in mirror of, of how simple the mere presence of people in forests can, can have a huge impact. At the same time, you need people in forests to ensure uh, proper management, including managing risks such as fires. So uh, one of the things uh, I think really we need the engagement of actors, the awareness of the importance, their awareness of the importance of biodiversity, their awareness of what the impacts of what they are doing on biodiversity in a simple way, and then, okay, care and knowing what they can do about that and be able to uh, act and, 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 in, and be enabled for this. I think one of the points uh, to highlight is the importance of education, training and information uh, and capacity building. And just to conclude, three areas that I think can provide considerable opportunities for mainstream biodiversity in forest management and amongst forest stakeholders. First, uh, restoration and the huge potential in secondary forests. I mean, from the 52% of forests that are either not protected or not just managed for timber, this is a huge area how to keep this forest as forest, maybe, or, or agroforest. I think the example of Ethiopia is, 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 is a very important one. Uh, second, uh, a recent study that we, C4 Aircraft, conducted with FAO as part of the roadmap for innovative forest technologies in the Asia and the Pacific region has shown that innovative technologies have huge potential for monitoring forest biodiversity and share knowledge. I mean, even uh, device to, to monitor sound within forests continuously and so on. Um, and, and second, I think, and last, sorry, uh, biodiversity has a, has a key role to play for forest resilience, Robert has mentioned that, and for adaptation to climate change. And I think integrating forests and their biodiversity in adaptation strategies and plans can at the same time raise awareness and facilitate measure and implementation. And this is why, to conclude, to finish, uh, C4 Aircraft with a range of partners, we're now launching also a big platform that is called Trees Adapt, that will provide sort of a one-stop shop to facilitate the implementation of measures to mainstream uh, biodiversity in forestry and by doing so, leverage the roles of forest and trees for, for adaptation. So knowledge, tools, and making it as simple as it is as just simple area protection. Wonderful. Thank you. Nicely concluded. Thank you very much to Vincent Gitz from uh, C4. Now, we are fast approaching 9.45, and I know we're going to lose our interpreters at 9.45, but I still think it'd be worth 
trying to get one or two questions or comments from the floor before we move into our, the final phase of this session and we'll hear a final remarks from Mr. Thomas Hofer. But do we have Adam, a comment or a question, a bit of feedback briefly before, ah yes, sir, could you put your microphone on, tell us who you are and your brief comment or question. Uh, we have a microphone for okay. you. Thank you very much uh, for the uh, good presentations by the introduction speakers and the panel afterwards. Um, in order to, to make my question, we'll give a brief introduction we, we're doing in Latin America and the Caribbean uh, in our FEO office. Besides uh, working on the normal forestry uh, themes, we're also working on issues related to vulnerable species, invasive species, and the management of uh, protected areas. Now, working with those protected areas, so very much linked with the different agencies working on, on conservation, that has searched from their side also a new issue, which I'm not quite sure if it's the right uh, translation in English, but it's something like the other effective, effective measures of conservation based on areas. What does it mean? So that means that the people working on the conservation side are also starting to look outside their protected areas. So I think something very interesting is happening that both forestry is starting to think about more biodiversity in their managed forest and the conservation sector is also thinking about working outside the protected areas. So my big my question is, does it not, is it not logical at this stage that uh, the different sectors like forestry and conservation but also the different agencies like FAO, UNEP, OECN should start to collaborate a lot more on, on these kind of uh, issues? Okay, thank you very much indeed. Who would like to respond briefly to that? Um, Ms. Anna Klitschova. Yes, I think it is. Yeah, but let me start time. quickly on responding to that question. So, yes, we need collaboration. We need, um, we need a joint thinking, since that's the, we are in the beginning of the paradigm shift here that we are having the areas of our interest starting to expand and overlap, so which is, is, is a good trend what we see. So, and what I think is important now is that all of us, the agencies with the different expertise and with the different mentalities, right, the conservation, which was before versus of management. So that probably the time when we have to bring two camps together on the certain areas of where our extended interests are overlapping. And uh, that's a big area where we should be working, um, like starting right now. Very good. Thank you. Thank you very much. And do we have one more question or comment? Yes, gentleman right in the middle there. You have a microphone. Thank you. Yes, please. Thank you. And uh, since I'm going to be um, negotiating in the CBD at the end of the year, this is really, really timely information. So this is excellent. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, also, the, the, the background information, the scientific information we should be using. Um, uh, Mr. Kanishi Shono said at the beginning mentioned um, payments for ecosystem services, which is an old topic. But, you know, if, if you want to see action, you have to follow the money. So um, I hear a lot of uh, movement in the um, Swiss uh, voluntary market, voluntary carbon market in the direction of biodiversity credits and even expanding that to nature credits. And so I just wondered if uh, C4 ECROF, FAO have uh, some uh, engagement already in, in this area. Thank you. Do you or do Mr. Witz? Do you have any uh, engagement? It, it, well, we, we, we don't, but, but we, we don't because we, we think it's, it's, it's something that really needs to be worked out at this stage, making uh, biodiversity instruments as simple as the carbon instrument. We, we don't want the carbon instrument to, to rule everything that can be done about forest and, and environment. So this is a challenge that we are really able to, we're really willing to, to contribute to, yes. Thank you very much. I did say that was the last, but Madame there apparently did have her hand up and I didn't see. So um, could we get the microphone? You have to do some Eliud Kipchoge running. Did you see him in the marathon the other day in Berlin? World record, fantastic. You know, I love my athletics. Yes, Madame. Merci. Okay. Merci beaucoup. Donc, je remercie la FAO Le Cifor pour euh, l'étude réalisée. 
Ma question, c'est sur... Euh, euh, parmi les recommandations, il nous, avait, il nous a été dit de réglementer la culture des PFNEL. Nous avons euh, des produits forestiers non ligneux. Nous avons réussi à réglementer euh, la culture des bois d'œuvre par euh, l'aménagement forestier. Nous avons quantifié et nous avons euh, toutes les statistiques. En matière de PFNEL, nous n'avons pas encore réalisé les inventaires. Je voudrais savoir comment allons-nous procéder par la réglementation de la culture de ces produits forestiers non ligneux. Merci. Uh, if I understood you correctly, um How do we proceed when it comes to regulating these forest products? Is, is that essentially what you said? Mr. Vitz, you were nodding. Who would like to respond to that one? Do you would like to respond? Well, I can, but also I'm, I'm sure that Robert <laughs> would, would, be, would Robert? have a lot to say. Okay, tell. Robert, you, you respond. Microphone. And you may have to speak en français parce que je crois que l'interprétation a fini. Je vais, donc je vais répondre en français. Euh, le, le problème des produits forestiers non ligneux, et en particulier dans le, le bassin du Congo, c'est la diversité. Donc le, le bois, les espèces commerciales, c'est connu de longue date, etc. Les produits forestiers non ligneux, c'est une question un peu plus compliquée. Et c'est compliqué en matière d'inventaire parce que si ce que vous recherchez, c'est le fruit euh, d'une espèce, euh, il faut trouver l'espèce, si c'est euh, euh, la viande de beau, si c'est euh, euh, une racine, etc. Donc il y, y, y a toute une classification. On a, on a fait euh, plusieurs travaux là-dessus. Le, le seul moyen de, de faire des inventaires euh, qui soient relativement euh, efficients et pas trop chers, c'est de, de faire des inventaires multi-ressources en même temps qu'on fait l'inventaire pour l'aménagement forestier. Euh, S'il faut refaire un inventaire après, ça coûte trop cher. Donc il faut choisir une, un nombre limité de produits forestiers non ligneux, les plus importants ou ceux qui, qui, qui ont le plus de, de chances d'être exploités, surexploités ou commercialisés, et, et focaliser sur ces produits en même temps qu'on fait l'inventaire forestier, avec des, après c'est des problèmes de technologie, donc c'est plus vraiment des problèmes de, 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 de mise en œuvre. Mais euh, si on essaie de faire un inventaire complet, etc., donc on, on finit par être un petit peu comme, comme les Danaïdes euh, en essayant de remplir leur tonneau, quoi, et on finit par pleurer. Euh. Donc il vaut mieux, je crois, c'est limiter un petit nombre de produits forestiers dans le milieu qui sont soit établis sur le marché, soit on pense que, et, et faire ça, combiner ça avec les inventaires d'aménagement forestier. Okay, and um, not everybody here is a French speaker, and I think the interpretation may have stopped. In 30 seconds, what did that mean in English? Well, in English, I mean, it's sort of, because there are so many of NTFPs, I mean, you cannot get an inventory that is for all. So you have to select which one you think are important in one place. Then you have to run the inventory of your NTFP at the same time as your timber inventory so that you don't duplicate cost. And, 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 and ultimately, that's the only way you can be efficient in doing inventory of NTFP in the context of production forest. Thank you very much indeed. I appreciate that contribution. Right, okay, I think we on this panel have finished. So thank you, thank you very much to our panelists. <clears throat> Mr. Klesova, Mr. Ventre, Mr. Tanimoto, Mr. Ugesa, and Mr. Gates. Our final contribution is going to be brief, I think, so we can stay in our seats. And let me invite Mr. Thomas Hofer, who started us off, uh, back to the podium. And to remind you, Mr. Hofer is Senior Forestry Officer at FAO, leading the Forest Biodiversity and Restoration Team. Just to offer your reflections on the discussion and to throw us forward. Where do we go from here? Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for these excellent panel, panelists. I try to summarize what we heard, you know, in six, maybe take home message, I will try, but it's very difficult because it was very rich the discussion. The first message is, it's again a wake-up call we have, you know, from the study, but also from what we heard from the, from the panelists and from Kenichi's presentation and from the keynote from Robert. So, a wake-up call for action. The second um, take-home message, I think we have unpacked a little bit what means biodiversity mainstreaming in forests. And I think it's clear it, it is reflecting or considering biodiversity in any 
as activity related to sustainable forest management, but it's a little bit more. We also heard about connectivity, which has also to do with biodiversity mainstreaming. We heard about policy coherence across different policies is part of biodiversity mainstreaming. And finally, forest biodiversity mainstreaming should not be there in isolation because forests are part of a landscape. So that's the second take home message. The third is about mainstreaming biodiversity it does not mean protection alone. It's not in protected areas, it's in protected areas, but maybe even more important in production landscapes. So we are talking about um, conservation through sustainable use. Or in other words, we need a win-win situation on one hand for forest biodiversity, but also for the, the communities depending on biodiversity, benefit sharing and so on. The fourth uh, take home message is about the study which has a diversity of recommendations. And these recommendations, they are available for implementation now. And it's not just available, I think we all have a responsibility to use them and to implement them. The fifth take home message, we have heard that the global development uh, framework is extremely conducive to do that. We heard from Jamal the last, you know, hurdles which are being taken to agree on the post-2020 biodiversity framework and the different targets which are of relevance to forest biodiversity. But we also know that we have the decade on ecosystem restoration, we have the decade on family farming, we have the SDGs. So I think the development framework today is extremely conducive to actually implement what this study is about. And the sixth take home message is quickly what FAO is now doing. We are, as you know, and that was discussed yesterday, we are implementing the, the strategy on mainstreaming biodiversity across agriculture sectors and the plenary yesterday, we had an update where we are with this. Within this framework, we are developing now, together with a lot of partners and with countries, uh, a global program for biodiversity, forest biodiversity mainstreaming. So to contribute to this strategy with a forestry entry point. And to do that, we are planning to have a number of global components, which are capacity building, which are sharing of lessons learned, but more importantly, at national level to support countries who are interested in really implementing a package of activities coming out of the study. So this is just to tell you that we are working on this because for us, this study, as we said, is a start and not an end. Um, I would like to thank all contributors once again who have um, worked on this study. I don't want to, um, it's, it's C4, ECRAF, it's the countries who have provided case studies, it's many others, but I would like to particularly thank Vincent Gitz and Alexander Maybeck from C4, ECRAF, and my colleague Kenichi Shono, um, who have orchestrated the development of this study in a very, very participatory, very skilled way over these two years. So this is, um, and I don't know, Henry, can you allow me for one more minute? Yes, yes, I can. <laughs> A quick announcement, um, which is still related to biodiversity, forest biodiversity, but, but which brings us into the urban um, uh, environments, because Tony, I think you, you mentioned specifically, you know, the, 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 di the dimension of urban environments we have and the importance of biodiversity in there. So urban forests and trees are key components of sustainable urban development, providing a wide range of ecosystem goods and services. In 2018, FAO and its partners organized the first edition of the World Forum on Urban Forests in Mantova, Italy, with over 700 participants from 70 countries. And we all know that since then, the urban forest agenda has increased tremendously through different initiatives. Now, I am pleased to announce officially today that the second edition of the World Forum on Urban Forests will take place in Washington, D.C., more or less a year from now, 16th to 20th of October next year, with the overall theme, um, Greener, Healthier and Happier Cities for All. The aim of the forum is to highlight the contribution of urban forests and trees to economic development, environmental justice, 
improved social cohesion, ecosystem restoration, and increased public awareness. And this forum is being organized with a very broad stakeholder partnership by FAO, the Arbor Day Foundation, the US Forest Service, the City of Washington, the Politecnico di Milano, Italian Society of Silviculture and Forest Ecology, the International Society of Arboriculture, and the Smithsonian Institution. If you want to know more about this forum, your man is there, Simone Borellis is there, so contact him if you want to know more about this. So, that's to conclude. Wonderful. Thank you very much, and let's work together on implementing uh, what we have worked on and what is in this publication on mainstreaming forest biodiversity. Thank you all. Thank you very much. That was beautifully summarized, Thomas. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much to our panelists. Thank you very much for being here, and I wish you a fruitful rest of day. Let's take this energy and the spirit forward. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, panel. Very good, thank you.